to the first Brit Technology Impact ser Series uh, event of the year. Um, for the new people, I'm Patrick Wheeler, and I run all the student programs for the Center for Digital Strategies. So each year we put on the Brit Series as a way to explore a particular theme or topic uh, in, in depth for the student body across the year. Um, this year we're focusing on digital customers and the ways in which digital technologies are changing um, customer relationships and, and sort of the power dynamics between <coughs> companies and corporations and customers, whether those are B2B or B2C, um, they're all changing as a result of te digital technologies. To kick off the year, we're excited to welcome Ted Chandler from Forrester Research, and I'll uh, let Ted, Ted kick it off and, and dive right in. Great. Please welcome Ted. Yep. Welcome back. First day of school for the second year. First day of class? Second day of class. Oh, today's Tuesday. Of course it is. I forget so quickly. Uh, so my name is Ted Shadler. I've actually been a forester a really long time, but my path to where I am, 20 years, but the path to where I, um, uh, how I got here is a little bit um, maybe relevant. So I thought I would quickly share it. So I went to college to study <laughs> physics, and um, I came from a family of scientists and engineers. And I, um, in fact, my physics professor heard I was going to business school right out of college, which was not true, and he was horrified. <laughs> but um, anyway, so I, um, I went to grad school in physics and hated it. I was bad at it. So I, I played rock and roll music for five years full time. That was my first job. Uh, then I got a degree in computer science. And that's relevant because uh, I love software. And I, I wrote a, a report for Forrester in 1998 called um, Every Business, Every Company is a Software Company. And it might have been a little premature, you know, before Mark Andreessen uh, said software eats the world, because in 98, the main thing that people had that was software was their website, and they were pretty crappy. They're still pretty crappy. Um, but uh, uh, I, I look at the world through software eyes. When developers get interested in something, I know the world's going to change in a fundamental way. And so that uh, uh, led me to go to business school at MIT Sloan. I joined Forrester. And Forrester's a place, great place for me because it's a place where technology and business and, and people kind of come together, both consumers, understanding consumer behavior, and then helping people get stuff done. So we do a lot of advisory and con not heavy con consulting, but a lot of advisory work. So that's just a little bit about, about me. I've written a couple of books, one called Empowered and one called The Mobile Mind Shift. So uh, writing reports is one thing. Writing a book is, uh, if, a, if a report is a quarter mile, you know, a book is a marathon. So um, it's, a, it's a lot of, a lot of freaking work. <laughs> um, how many of you know Forrester? Showing? Okay, most of you do. Good, good. Well, um, I'm just going to ask you, what do you think the most uh, powerful force affecting customers' relationships with companies today is? What empowers customers most today? Don't be shy. Service. Service. I would agree with that. Marketers don't think so, but I, I think that's uh, very much, very true. Yes, please. Insight into what customers do and maybe want to do. So intent-based analysis is, is out there. It's sort of lurking just over the, it's almost within reach. And it's, we're not quite there, mostly because we're not asking the right questions of the right data. That's good, because I actually brought some cool stuff on that. Good, other, uh, yeah, please. Directions between customers. Directions between, I'm not. Interactions. Oh, interactions, all right, so how customers uh, interrelate, which can be a powerful force for good, or of course for, for ill, if you're delivering a bad service. Yes, please. Right, so what does personalized mean today? Used to, for marketers, it means you click, you get. People like you bought stuff like this. Is that personal? Well, it's not the full context. It doesn't acknowledge what I bought from you last time or maybe the time of day or where I am. And so personal becomes very, we call it individualized. I don't love that word because it's kind of clunky. But personal really means me. Make it relevant to me. That's very important, I think. That's good. Other uh, quick thoughts? That's probably, probably, probably good. Um, so so uh, winning in the age of the customer. Uh, age of the customer is kind of Forrester's strategy. It's how we compete. We focus on customer th stuff, not back office stuff. So our, our focus on cloud computing, for example, would always be through the lens of innovation, not through the lens of cost cutting or just you know, running stuff uh, elsewhere. Um, so what's changed more in the last 10 years? Technology. This is a picture um, it was in Sports Illustrated yesterday. It was uh, taken on an iPhone 7 Plus. I mean, yeah, look at the quality of that picture. <laughs> That's from a phone, you know, amazing. And all, the good, all is behind that. Uh, 
channels, communication service channels. Um, Sephora is a leader here. Um, I don't know if you shop at Sephora at all, but uh, they were early to jump on this whole chatbot thing. I actually interviewed the head of digital for Sephora recently, and I said, um, you know, talk to me about your channel strategy, your, your customer channel strategy. And they have a very well-defined strategy for each channel, and it's different for each channel. So it's not like the web and the app and the mobile web and the chatbot and the in-store are all treated identically. They're optimized for what people are trying to do at those moments in their day. That's a very profoundly different approach to customers than most companies have. Most companies just like try to put the stuff out there and come get it, you know, self-service. Sephora thinks about service, about a direct service um, opportunity. Uh, or is it expectations? And I would argue that it's expectations that have changed the most. Because people are not comparing, say, within a category um, in a B2B setting, they're not comparing within their um, uh, uh, market that, the other, that they're competing in. They're comparing in the best in the world because that's the experience we all have as consumers. So they're comparing against Uber or they're comparing against Starbucks loyalty or they're comparing against Netflix. And so the bar for the quality of the experience is set extremely high. And it doesn't matter whether you're buying a Schneider Electric manufacturing product or something from Sephora or something from uh, Walmart, you expect, or, or on a booking an airline ticket, your expectations are very high that you're going to know who I am, what I want, you're going to price competitively, you're going to find ways to anticipate my needs and put it in front of me before I even know I need it. And that does lead to some wacky behaviors, which I think we can um, talk about at the end a little bit. But you think about um, this word ecosystem, very popular word right now. I thought he says, what, what's the ecosystem? Because to me, there's like, there's somebody who wins, somebody who has control, and somebody gets a check, somebody writes a check. Very simple. Um, ecosystem, we all rise together? Mm, maybe, maybe. Um, so uh, just quickly, uh, customer, uh, companies have historically had power, the power of information. You went to the store to learn. You picked up the phone to get service. But of course, technology shifted power to consumers, business customers and, and consumers. In the business customer realm, um, most of the decision making has happened before you ever talk to somebody. There are, I think on average, our data says around seven interactions that precede a phone call, meaningful interactions that um, at the product information level. So when, you, when that salesperson calls, your customer's already convinced. So what's the salesperson's job in that, in that case? So uh, empowered customers, uh, so we call it the age of the customer. Um, just a, a little bit of data, Forrester does 500,000 completes, survey completes a year. We have a community data set, this is survey data. We have a tracking data set, so we, we track um, behavior on phones, for example. And a lot of that data tends to shatter a lot of um, myths, but when you look at the trend line of data, you see what's at work, the, the power uh, uh, of, of consumer adoption, consumer behavior change uh, at work. So this number, um, these numbers keep rising, smartphone numbers keep rising, we're on our way to 91% of online adults in um, India, and globally we're, we're on our way to, um, I think around 70% is our forecast globally for smartphones, and that includes poor people as well as rich people. It includes, if you go to India, for example, people have been to India, been, okay, great. So um, the Flipkart uh, is the biggest retailer in India, and they, they can't really do it with an app because people won't download the app. The data plans are too expensive, the networks are too um, you know, scarce. So they actually attract and sell business through the web, but the web is pretty awful for shopping. Even just logging in is pretty awful. So they, on their phones, uh, they invented something they called Flipkart Lite. And it's a bare bones, you know, really pared down experience. And that's driving most of their loyalty, most of their um, retail, according to the, the CTO that I talked to a couple weeks ago. So the smartphone adoption is huge. Laptop adoption is actually falling a little bit. Desktop adoption is sort of centering around a home, uh, a shared space type, type computer. Tablets are kind of stuck. This number includes employee purchased and employer purchased. So if you take out the employer purchased tablets, it's a much lower number. And the, the traffic from tablets is flat in the US. So tablets have 
become a specialized product, a specialty product, and then connect to TV, and that's getting more interesting. So um, a lot of devices. Um, I believe, that's why I wrote a book about it, that um, mobile's the biggest game changer uh, out there. So do me a favor, pull out your phones. And while you're doing that, wonder out loud what everybody's using their phones for in the bathroom. Um, uh, light them up, uh, unlock them. Um, hand them to your neighbor. Okay, I'm really, I'm really kidding. I'm really kidding. But you know how you felt, right? Yeah, you did. You did. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, so you know how that made you feel. It was like, oh my god, that's my most personal thing. I, uh, when uh, Julie Osk and I wrote The Mobile Mind Shift, we talked a lot about this. Why, why are we so in love? Why are we so uh, needy when it comes to our, our phones? And I, I think of them as a little bit of a, of a magic wand. You, know, you wave the wand and, and good things happen. But there, there's more to it than that, I think. I think the, the biggest impact of technology on people generally is that it makes them feel um, in control, it makes them feel powerful, it makes them feel protected. And that was true for PCs. You know, people would rush to the, uh, to the well, probably you guys don't remember this, but people would rush to the internet cafes to get online when they were in a foreign country because it was the only way they could get the news or get maps or something like that. And, and now with phones, of course, we have it in our, our pockets. And so when you hand it to somebody, you, you lose power. You're, you're powerless. And that's kind of a weird feeling. And it's a very psychologically rich and important feeling because it suggests if you're trying to serve customers, um, what your frame of reference should be when it comes to engaging on the phone. And we call those mobile moments. When somebody pulls out their phone and tries to engage with you, you have a moment in time that they've, they want something from you. You can help them. And you have a choice, succeed or fail. And apps are largely succeeding. It took a long time for apps to get good enough to work. Early on, they were horrible. Um, and web is failing. Mobile web is, is failing. I'm actually working on a I think an important report, I've talked to 60 companies, including Facebook and Sephora and Amazon and eBay, um, Google, Apple, Microsoft, um, United Airlines, some of the biggest brands on the planet, to understand how they're dealing with this. And most of them are not. Most of them are kind of in denial about it. Um, Flipkart's not. Um, Amazon's not. Uh, eBay's not. So to me, this was the biggest um, still game changer. And I would say beware of fads. So this was a very expensive fad. And I remember this because um, I'm old. This is a bomb shelter. Now, in a nuclear attack, is going to your cellar with canned goods going to keep you alive? Yes, maybe, as long as you're not at ground zero, but probably better to move to Hanover, where the bomb's <laughs> not going to fall. So it, uh, it's a fad in the sense that it, 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 the problem was real, the opportunity was real, but the investment was made based on a completely um, misguided belief system about what the impact of radiation would be. Um, and so uh, that, uh, uh, to me, is a fad. Also beware of niche markets. And this is where the press is very dangerous. If you're pulling from the headlines, pull with a very skeptical eye. And um, how many of you wear an Apple Watch? How many of you used to wear an Apple Watch? Um, OK, good. You guys are uh, probably in line with, with my, my belief. This is, a, this is a niche market. I mean, GoPro had a fabulous business with a natural cap on it. They could reach, pick the number, 15% of, of, of adults, 12%, 7%, but not 80%. Um, music players. I mean, how many people buy music? Turns out to be about 40% of the population. How many people listen to music? Well, almost everybody. They listen to the radio. <laughs> So when you think about consumer behavior and consumer trends, be really careful to say, ask yourself, would my mother use this? Would my cousin use this? Would I use it tomorrow? Would the people down the street use it? Would the people at the state fair use it? Would the people in the airport use it? Would the people at the mall, if they still exist, use it? And if the answer is, hmm, I'm not sure, then really ask yourself, is it real or not? Is it a meaningful uh, change? And so Snapchat, to me, is a really interesting um, example. It's, I Snapchat with my daughter. 
Um, she's very happy to, to, to talk to me that way, not through, through texting. Um, she's 15, and um, it's cool, you know, I love it, she loves it. Are they, is Snapchat gonna make as much money as Facebook on advertising? Are they gonna reach as many people and have as much dwell time without intruding on the experience of Snapchat, which is a communications experience? Mostly, it's not mostly a media consumption experience the way Facebook has become. Well, if you're valuing Snapchat, and right now it's an $8 billion valuation. I wrote a report actually you might want to send around. It's called, um, What Happens After the Unicorn Carnage? <laughs> so right, unicorns are the one billion. And, and, and the, market, the economy's been healthy this year in the lead up to the election. So the funding has continued and there's been some decent IPOs. But trust me, these companies are massively overvalued. Uber is massively overvalued. Netflix is overvalued. Snapchat is probably massively overvalued, certainly overvalued. So when you're asking yourself, is this real? Ask, is everybody gonna use it or not? And if they are gonna use it, what are they gonna do with it? And can I inject my service into that? So let's use chat, uh, chatbots as an example. Is Sephora gonna make a lot of money with chatbots? Well, what's the model for chatbot? What questions might somebody ask of a chatbot? Of oh, Siri, of Cortona, whatever. They're gonna ask like three questions. Where's the store? Where's my order? And place that same order again because I placed it a week ago or a month ago and I want the same thing. In other words, very small number of very simple interactions. So is it gonna replace the website or the phone? Or, no. Is it gonna be an interesting channel when you're on the go? Yes, for a small number of activities. So be careful not to, or be careful to ask how many people and how often? Uh, so so that's, that's the thing I wanted to leave you with. Also, what, what are the customer's goals and what are your goals as a business? And make sure there's good intersection between those in order to take advantage of that technology. Now, I'm a bit of a skeptic at Forrester, but here's the data on wearables. Last year, 21% of uh, companies we interviewed for, uh, or surveyed for almost 5,000 said they used uh, wearables, and, 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 and now it's 14%. So wearables include Fitbits and watches and crap like that. So look at Gen Y. 46% said they used a wearable last year. And 28% said they used a wearable this year. OK, sounds like a fad to me. Not saying there's not real value. Fitbit's fabulous if you're a Fitbit, you know, fitness junkie. How many people are fitness junkies? Some. I happen to be when I use Strava. <laughs> um, so the, the other thing about technology, and I believe the biggest impact of technology, and, and I don't know what, if this will be a theme you'll hear over and over and over again, but the biggest impact of technology on companies is, in fact, direct uh, to, to customer service, getting it sort of bypassing the intermediary. All these distribution channels, uh, 3M, for example, has 72,000 uh, distributors, and they have a three-tier um, distribution channel. It's consolidating. They anticipate that it will be cut in half in the next, uh, I think they said eight years. So in other words, the number of distributors and the rise of their direct to customer channel they expect to grow. And the company they're most worried about is Amazon. Because Amazon for business is growing very quickly. And they're selling products the same way they sell products to consumers, except they're selling to business customers. And so if you're 3M, your entire channel strategy, your entire marketing strategy your entire technology infrastructure, your entire product line is gonna change. So HBO was early to see this. They did not build the network. In fact, MLB built the network, Major League Baseball. But HBO is using MLB's network to go direct to consumer. So they saw, well, the cable guys have broadband, we'll use that. So when you think about the benefit to HBO, it's that they have a much clearer sense of what people want, what they do, what they're viewing what their habits are. Netflix has taken that knowledge to create the best in class today, personalization. They've also created great addiction. <laughs> wait, wait, I'm not ready to start the next show. I have to go to the bathroom. Um, so it, it changes the nature of customer relationships. And this is the hardest thing for established companies. It's the hardest thing for banks. It's the hardest thing for media companies. It's the hardest thing for manufacturers because how are they going to do it when their entire culture, their, all their DNA, all their assets, all their investment um, strategies have been aligned around an indirect relationship with customers? And now their business models have to change. 
So another example would be um, uh, Under Armour. They, when they first acquired Mount My Fitness, I, I actually knew the guy who funded Mount My Fitness, uh, Michael Dodd, um, out of Austin Ventures, I think he was, at at the time. And so I, got, I interviewed the guys, and it wasn't a big sale, it wasn't a huge exit, but it was a really important exit because Under Armour is looking, again, Under Armour sells through distribution. How do they get close to their customers? How do they know what customers want? And Nike had made a bunch of things there, but not terribly successfully. Nike's direct to customer service business is, is tiny. Under Armour is getting pretty big because it has leveraged these digital, direct, uh, digital um, assets. So yeah, they use it for marketing and, and whatnot, but they mostly use it for customer intelligence to know what the heck people want. So they can do micro-segmentation instead of just segmentation. Um, and then this one I love. This was a unicorn exit a Dollar Shave Club that uh, uh, Unilever bought. And they bought it because Unilever's been selling razor blades at Walgreens and CVS forever. But now they can sell directly on a subscription basis. So it's a tremendously different model for direct uh, service. So there's a question I would ask, if you, for those of you who are more sort of business theorist types, which is, will there be new intermediaries that we um, rely on for product recommendations? And right now it's Amazon, but are they doing a good job with this adjacent product um, relationship that I want to have? Because that's what we relied on a retailer for, right? Sort, sort ca ca you know, categories and, and selection. That's what retailers do, and they have stores. Um, and is Amazon going to do that? Not today. Not today. So will there be the rise of a new intermediary, a personalization intermediary, somebody who really knows my needs and the needs of people in my family the way Netflix does? Probably. Probably, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, so now let's, let's shift into strategy a little bit. Uh, there's, of course, business strategy, which is our products and our operations and uh, what our revenue model is and what our staffing model is. And then there's what customers expect, what, um, it, which is sort of uh, what uh, drives your execution. What digital strategy is, is really just business strategy through digital using technology. And so I was talking to the chief digital officer at AT&T and they've had a digital strategy for customer care for a long time, right? The website, pretty crappy, but they have it. But their investments in digital, um, she reports by way to the um, CTO, and really he's, he's a COO, his name's John Donovan, who reports to the CEO. And her strategy, her goal, the reason she exists at AT&T, is to cut across all the functions, sales, marketing, products, customer care, and say, if we put the customer at the center, will think differently about the products they want, the way they want to buy, they want the way they want to be cared for. And we'll think very differently about our functional structures at AT&T to, to deliver on that. So her little, she had little buttons made, digital's not a channel. Because <laughs> that was, they were getting stuck. Digital, oh, that's the website. No, digital is this direct to, to customer engagement. So um, yeah, this is the primary thing uh, digital does, and I, I've, I've said it a, a number of times already. So Julie and I wrote this book around this, um, what we call mobile moments, simple, immediate, and contextual. So personalized means in my context, knowing as much as possible about me without getting creepy, and then offering to serve me within that context. And if I say go away, respecting that. And so something as simple as I'm on your website on my phone and you're pitching your app, and I said no already. So why am I going to say yes now? I already said no. X, close that stupid little banner. And I just might look over to the website. Here it comes again. That's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. And yet people in marketing think that's wonderful because they get a little tiny bit of conversion. But the customer sap psh, goes down. So when you talk to Amazon about this, they're really clear. Digital for them, and of course a digital company, is not just about revenue. It's about satisfaction. Did the customer have a good experience? And the reason that's meaningful is they'll come back. That's the most important thing for them. Not just did they sell the product, but will they come back? And it drives everything they do in their, in their product management, everything. They seek to do something meaningful, and they seek to do it in a way that fits into the customer's flow, into what they're trying to accomplish. And if they're unsuccessful with that, they fix it. They don't just say, here it is, hope you like it. They go back and they fix it. They have these ideas in mind when they do that. 
So, uh, yeah, you don't have much time. You would spend minutes on the website. You'd spend um, seconds or even milliseconds. I was talking to the Washington Post yesterday, and they um, have built a web uh, technology called Progressive Web Apps, and it's basically snap loading of a website on the, on the uh, phone. So instead of waiting three seconds, which is the average for them before, before the ads load and stuff like that. It's one second for the first page mm -hmm. and 200 milliseconds for the second, third, and fourth pages. That, that, so, okay, that's cool. What, is it, what does it drive? It drives 6x more time on post.com. 6x improvement in engagement mm -hmm. because you cut from three seconds down to a second and then 100 milliseconds. So when you think about technology investments, don't think about, <laughs> we'll build it and hope it works. Think about what the impact is on customers and force a decision process that goes, if it's not working, we need to um, fix it. This is what being customer-led means. And most companies can't get this into their heads. You ask, who's responsible for customers? Oh, customer service or sales or the CEO. Not true. Product, marketing, sales, operations. So there are two parts to make this happen. One is to focus on the digital customer experience, and the other is to focus on the digital operations. So let's use banking as an example. Anybody from the banking industry? A couple of you. Okay, so um, I talked to NAB, National Australia Bank, a couple days ago, or a couple weeks ago, and um, uh, what's his name? Not Tim. Nick, Nick Walters. He has 400 people, direct reports, and another 150 dotted line. He's the chief digital officer, basically. And he's built an online banking product, which everybody has, uh, which is an online website and a, and a native app. And um, they had to build these APIs, 300 APIs, business APIs, they call them, uh, in order to, to do it. So you can start a transaction over here on your phone and, and finish it uh, you know, over here on, your, on, on the PC. That's, not, that's cheap. The spend on that is like $100 million. That, that's inexpensive in the scale of, of, of NAB's uh, budget. The big spend, where Morgan Stanley is spending, for example, is $2 billion. Because the real spend is in the operational excellence. It's in those systems of record, those banking systems, those transaction systems, those customer care systems. Because if you don't fix those, you're stuck. You can only go, like, well, here's what we have. Hope you like it in a different screen size. How about new products? New capabilities. If you're a bank, what are you most worried about? You're worried about being disintermediated and having sort of the whittling away in your retail business. So what do you need to do? You need to project your banking service out to as many touch points as possible, ones you own and ones you borrow or ones you support. So think about a retail transaction. If the bank can be there, and this is what PayPal's doing, of course, then they win because they own the transaction, they own the customer relationship. To do that, they've got to change their banking engines. It's not a $10 million or $50 million investment. It's a billion dollar investment. Home Depot, $1.5 billion. Because they had to change their distribution warehouse scheme. Order on phone, pick up in store. Yeah, but I want it this afternoon. You don't have it in your store. Oh, well, we'll get it to the store by this afternoon. Well, how do they do that? Well, they've got to build gigantic distribution centers. It's not, they started with a, our customers are mobile and we're behind. This was the CEO announcement. And we're going to spend $150 million over, um, over five years. And then he came out six months later. This is last year. Year ago. Year and, and 15 months ago. And said, oh, it's $1.5 billion. <laughs> and the street applauds it. Because the street goes, oh, he gets it. He understands his customers have needs. And he's going to lose if he doesn't actually address those needs. That requires huge operational excellence. Those warehouses, the distribution center, that supply chain reaches all the way back up to the supply. Okay, now let's add a little uh, digital operational flavor to it. What if there's risk in the supply chain? You build cars. There's risk in your supply chain. You know, parts aren't going to work, or they're going to be missing, or they're, they're stuck on a freaking freighter in the middle of the ocean because that shipping company just went bankrupt. How do you anticipate risk in your supply chain and optimize your operations to overcome it? That's a digital initiative that relies on visibility through data to what's going on so you can go, oh, crap. We are exposed here. We better find an alternative supplier, or we better stockpile, or we better do something so that we are not exposed to that level of risk. So when you think about the impact of digital, it's not just customers. It's things that affect your ability to serve customers. 
So it reaches all the way back into the core of these companies. That's hard. So we uh, call it customer obsessed, and we have these four principles, and I'm gonna zero in on just one of them, insights driven today, but customer led, that's um, measuring what works and what doesn't work. I, I call it analyze to optimize. Analyze the impact so you can optimize the experience. Um, fast, not perfect, that's agile. Everybody's using these multidisciplinary agile teams. The guy at NAB said, we've gotten comfortable with ambiguity. Banks historically, not comfortable with ambiguity. Very low risk taking, because they operate at massive scale. But they have to be comfortable with ambiguity because it's the only way they can advance the ball. And the way they've done it is they've created a beta test, crowdsourcing beta test, of employees and people that have opted in for the latest stuff. So they have, and you told me about like 10,000 in their kind of alpha test mode, who are willing to use the stuff and give feedback on it to be the, the guinea pigs. Banks don't do that. This one does. That's how they, that's how they innovate. Massive changes in behavior, culture, team alignment, funding models. It's very challenging for our customers and um, for many, many companies. And then connected, so that I already mentioned that around AT&T. So Insights Driven, I wrote a report with two colleagues recently called the Insights Driven Business, and I wanted to share a little bit of that with you. When you think back to this customer picture, um, we, you know, we move up here into this age of the customer, and the amount of data back in the 60s was pretty limited. We had product catalogs, we had you know, sales transaction data, we had financial data. Um, in the 90s, we had a lot more transaction data. We had CRM systems got big, not just ERP, but CRM. Um, and we started to buy third-party data, like profile data, credit score data, stuff like that. Yeah, but in the age of the customer, we have a lot of behavioral data, a lot of intent data from social, of course, a lot of um, location data, a lot of environmental data, like the weather. Why does IBM buy the weather channel? They buy it for two reasons. One is that the weather affects so many industries, whether it's assessing risk in the supply chain or selling umbrellas. So it has a collateral impact on people's behavior. And the second is they, the Weather Channel ingests, I don't know if they told me, like a terabyte of data a day from all these weather sensors. So they have a massive data ingestion and analysis infrastructure they built, which they can use for anything. They don't just have to use it for weather data. They can use it for social data for example. So that's why IBM buys, buys the Weather Channel. Um, that's environmental data. And then, of course, sensor data. Everybody likes to talk about the Internet of Things. Who loves that term? Who wants to go work for an Internet of Things company? <laughs> Praise God. Thank you. <laughs> so there are many, many interesting products that are either connected products, or a lot of them are industrial, of course, like refrigerators and jet engines. Um, and so the problem is that there's not, it's not a horizontal play. It's not like we're going to have some horizontal infrastructure tech play. Or, it's very specialized because the kinds of data, the data architectures, the sensor architectures, the operating models, they're extremely specialized by the application area, by the, by the industry and the function. So what John Deere does to optimize field uh, you know, fertilizer is different from what John Deere does, uh, what somebody else would do to optimize irrigation. Same scenario, growing crops, very different infrastructures, very different software, very different suppliers. So IoT kind of buries all that under a label. So it's very cool, do it, but get specific. Pick your industry, pick your sector, pick your application area, and go master that, get smart about that. Um, so the insights-driven business. So we have a lot of data that says firms aspire, aspire to be data-driven, but most of them say they're not good at doing anything with the data. And the big problem is, is that um, the data teams are like a cost center, like the customer insights team. They sit over in marketing. We can tell you everything you want to know about customers. Just come ask us. Meanwhile, the product teams are off here looking at it on their own. So there's not a link, a closed-loop learning, which is a huge mistake. Digital companies <laughs> don't do that. Digital companies build closed loop learning systems where the data changes the operations. And so um, we identified um, a, a bunch of companies that do this. I'll share a couple stories with you before we stop and take questions. Um, and define an insights driven business that harness and apply data and analytics at every opportunity to differentiate products and customer experiences. So it's kind of a clunky label. But we did a forecast of the startup world and um, uh, 40 uh, companies, public companies, 
uh, and projected their revenue out to 2020, and it's collectively $1.2 trillion. Now, these 40 companies, the way we picked them is that we looked at the 200 fastest growing companies on the planet, public companies, 30% CAGR over three years, and then we discounted their growth on an individual basis. We looked at the 200, one by one, and we picked 40 that we think are insights driven, that we either know because we've talked to them or we see that they're insights driven, that they, they use data to optimize their operations and improve their products and experiences. And so we did the forecast based on that of $1.2 trillion. That's a lot of money. A lot of these companies are, are, are big and um, getting, getting bigger. So um, here's, here's some examples. Um, I didn't put um, Alaska Airlines up here, but I could have. I'm going to actually um, give you an example of um, just one. Uh, let me, let me, let me just, I'll put this up. This is kind of like the <laughs> required consultant slide. Insights driven businesses are built differently and operate differently to steal your customers and take your revenue. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Let me share a quick story, personal story. So we were working on this, Brian Hopkins and James McCormick, and Brian brings me this idea like two years ago. And I love data, I love software. So we, we start exploring it. We publish this report, and the first call we get is from a defense agency who's responsible for assessing the um, compliance of defense contractors for uh, classified information. So if you're, there's a name for it, I forget. But if you're a, a, a defense company, you have to pass, your, your facility has to pass this inspection. Or else you, can't, you don't get the contract, or you get dinged, or you pay a, a penalty. So these guys they assess risk of information loss. And um, you know here we are in the cybersecurity, I can't use that word, hellhole that we're in. Uh, and they're trying to figure out how to use data and insights to help them manage risk. So it wasn't a marketing team or a product team. It was a national defense <laughs> urgency that said, we, we need to be insights driven. It's not enough to do field inspections. And we, I mean, what can we pull out of the 10Ks? What can we pull out of the public data? What can we pull out of the social networks to help assess risk of that facility? Very interesting conversation. So I'm going to use um, Stitch Fix as an example here. You guys know Stitch Fix? Mm -hmm. who, who uses Stitch Fix? OK, a few of you. So I don't know this company that started advertising NPR, except I've talked to their chief algorithmics officer like three times. His name's Eric Coulson. He's ex-Netflix. A lot of these guys, by the way, hire Netflix and, and Amazon people um, to, to, to be their, their algorithm person. So they uh, do, I don't even bring the whole story here, but they do, they're a truck retailer, so you give them a certain amount of money and put in your size and your style and your color preferences, and they ship you a box of clothes every month, right? And if you don't like it, you send it back. And so they have stylists who do that. So it's a people business. But they're trying to scale. They're a digital company. So the way they scale is they've built a matching algorithm, a style matching algorithm, to predict, based on what you bought, used last time, and, and your profile, and, and what the stylist has, has selected, what, you, what you're going to like most. And so an example would be, you know, I'm going to get a blue dress with a wide belt. Well, the algorithm might come back and say, well, actually, narrow belts seem to be working right now. And the stylist goes, you're full of you know, crap algorithm. We're going to do wide belts. And the algorithm says, well, why? And the stylist says, well, because didn't you just see it's fashion week, <laughs> right? Narrow belts are out, wide belts are in. I'm making this up, of course. And, um, and the algorithm is, OK, we'll, we'll fix our model. And then we'll watch it. And if it works, we'll, we'll reinforce the prediction as being positive. And it turns out everybody returns the wide belts. We're going to come back and tell you. We're going to say, you said wide belts, but look, it's too early. People just don't want narrow belts. So they marry algorithms and expertise. And to do that, you have to have an interface between the data and the, and the insights, the algorithms, and the people. So they have 200 employees, like a year ago, when I talked to them uh, um, for this data. And they have 40 data scientists. 200 people, 40 data scientists. And they have about um, 40 stylists as well. So now as they're scaling their company up, they do need to scale stylists. But they can um, use these algorithms to optimize the product selection. That's cool. That's a customer experience. But they went further. They used the insights to also optimize inventory. So the biggest cost in retail is either is, is, is you know, footage, stores, and inventory. So at a digital retailer, there's only one major cost, which is inventory. 
So how do you lower inventory? Well, you need to know what people want because you don't want to buy it ahead of time and you can't wait to get it because you're going to blow your monthly distribution model. So you buy stuff and you put it in your, in your warehouse and then you dole it out. Well, the algorithms say, and some of it's easy, like we have lots of people that are you know, six and eight and very few that are four and 12 size, so that's one thing. Color preferences, um, but also stylistic preferences. So they're able to optimize on the buyer side what, uh, what to buy. SKUs, colors, sizes. Um, and that's a major shift. They told us, they won't go on record on this, they told us that their inventory carrying costs, to their understanding, are about half of other online retailers. Half. Now you look at the major cost in their business is inventory, and they're running at half the cost. That's a pretty cool way to use data. So the combination of the customer experience and the operational excellence powered by insights. So what are insights really? They are building an algorithm, a model, uh, that reflects your service model, your customer need, uh, your customer's intent, um, your uh, operating model, whether it's inventory or staffing or uh, whatever it happens to be. And then you um, courageously assess whether it worked or not. And if it didn't work, you fix it. You don't, you know, so to do that, you can't have the data scientist over here and the marketing and product organization over here. They have to be together. That's the only way that the model gets smarter. And so in every single one of these companies, we saw data engineers, people that can assess quality of data and ingest data, data scientists, and domain experts uh, working on the same teams. Well, go sell that to GM. Go sell that to B of A. Go sell that to some other, you know, big company. They, they're like, really? That's really what happens? It's really what happens. All right, so I think I'm done. Um, you should be asking, what, how does technology empower, truly empower customers? How do they get really, really smart? And right now, you're all smarter than the store associate or the car guy. So how does technology empower customers? How do empowered customers change strategy? How do you change your strategy to serve empowered customers? A better way to word that. Where does technology intersect business? I don't mean the business, but business. Business people need to be smart enough about technology to be able to bring in the right resources, ask the right questions, assemble the right teams, find the right suppliers, hire the right skills. Every company is a software company. Every company is an insights company. Every company is a digital company. And then, of course, how do you operate in this world? So that, that's what I brought. Hopefully it wasn't too annoyingly loud and pungent, and I left us too little time probably to talk. What the, you want to have a hard stop now or at 1? No, 1. At 1 o'clock. Okay, good. So thanks for listening, and um, yeah, um, ask any questions you want, and hopefully we can, we can answer. So, no, no need to clap. Yes, please. <laughs> So what do you think about the newer trend of people being less receptive to startup apps and not downloading as many apps? Startup apps? Oh, or, or like or apps. apps in general. So we've hit peak app. I think we know that. I didn't bring that data slide, but last year, our data, we, I said we have this tracking data. People, last year, meaning um, in, in June, uh, in 2016, people used 26 apps on average. Guess how many apps they used a year before that in 2015? 26 apps. Now, if you're, people say, what about millennials? Guess how many apps millennials used? 28. <laughs> Two more. So we've hit peak app. So that doesn't mean that an app is uninteresting. I mean, apps are critically important to your best customers. So Amazon, because uh, again, we have this tracking data, 21% of online Americans, adults, use Amazon's app on a monthly basis. 40% on their, on their phones, 40% use Amazon's website on their phones every month. The overlap is about, I think, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember here, it's about 10%. So 10% use both the app and the website. So this is why we, have a, we really have a website crisis. The report I'm doing right now, actually, let me try this out on you. There's two titles we're thinking about. Uh, there are two reports. One report is how to fix it. That's called reinvent the mobile web or reinvent the web for mobile moments, and that builds on our mobile moments uh, work. Uh, that one, I'm not ready to. 63 companies were interviewed for that. We're almost done. The first report is the problem report, 
Now, most people like invested a lot of money on their website to make it kind of work on phones, so, but it's not working. So one title might be, um, it's time for a mobile web intervention. And another report might be, a billion websites, uh, a billion mobile sites spark no joy. <laughs> Any votes? First, first one, intervention title versus the billion sites spark no joy. OK, that's good. I love crowdsourcing. Thank you. Um, so if you've got a great app, you have to find a way to get it into people's hands. Why are they going to care about it? So you have to find a way to get them to care about it. And pushing it at them is not going to do it. And discovering the app store is not going to do it. You need to have a business of which there's an app. The app is not the business. So you have, that's what you have to do. It doesn't mean that you walk away from apps, not by any stretch. You just like the web more app-like. So sorry I went too long on that one. Other questions? Yes, please. Um, I'm just curious if you've seen these companies that have been successful with uh, digitally engaging with and kind of adapting with their customers, have they been engaging any sort of set of frameworks or like documented strategies? Or has it been more of, you know, let's have a really smart strategy group, let's have some smart data sciences, right. science, scientists, and let's really get the, uh, the buy-in in the C-suite. Um, has it been more sort of custom for each company, or, or yep. have they been following any strategies? So, so what I'll say is that there are a set of tools that are very, they're universal. Um, one of them is customer journey mapping. Uh, and so that's just basically a picture that looks like what co how customers engage. You enhance that tremendously when you do it in software because you can put analytics into it. You can show what that day, what was the level of engagement on in that touch point. That's the dashboard thing you saw up there. And um, you can make it available to everybody. So journey mapping is one tool. Um, another tool are the agile teams. Not just agile tech teams, but agile business teams. And what, what you can do with an agile team is you can take a small number of people in a, in a, in a relatively confined part of the organization and you jam them together without changing the reporting structure or any of that stuff, and you essentially launch it as a um, sort of executive-sponsored skunk works. And so agile development is the second tool. And the third tool is insights. You, you bring the data uh, so that people have to acknowledge what's going on. So I'll give you an example. I was talking to um, a B2B company in the tech industry, and they have just redone their website, and I'm actually gonna talk to her later this afternoon. And um, she said, we, we did an audit of, a, a of the information on our website globally of what people um, use, and it turns out people have never used two-thirds of the content. Now, if you own that content, you think it's important. But customers uh, don't use two-thirds of it. So what do you do? You courageously remove two-thirds of the content. That's what you do. Having the data makes that possible. None of that happens, none of that happens without the CEO. None. Mm -hmm. It's like throwing a rock against the wall. So if you're at a company where the CEO doesn't get it, find a different company. <laughs> There's no other way to do it. So those three tools are very common, and then um, leadership. So, yes, please. relates to small businesses. So I work for an e-commerce client under 25 million, and we really struggled with leveraging data to inform that customer experience. And in the process, it really strikes me that, you know, at, at least I felt like this for small businesses, that you're never going to be competitive on that edge. You're just catching up. And so I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. So I agree with that concern. In this insights-driven um, uh, business research, we've talked to lots of startups. So Ernest is a student loan uh, originator, for example. And they, instead of just pricing loans based on credit score, they price based on uh, all the information you share with them. So you share your credit cards, you share your, your transcript, <laughs> you share your address, of course, and, and normal stuff. And they, they price the loans. And there's a loan officer that actually uh, you know, authorizes the loan, but the algorithm puts a price out there based on a much more nuanced understanding of people's true risk. And so that's an example of a company that the more data they have on that, the, the more informed and the more accurate uh, their pricing is going to be. So they have a very strong belief that they have to go get very big very quickly because they can't create a differentiated insight into pricing without that. 
So I think we see these massive returns to scale in these areas that are well-defined. And so I, I think the age of the mom and pop retailer will exist in niche categories, but in big categories, I think they will be um, uh, eroded over time. So, yes, please. Do you have any good examples of uh, cities or the government sector in that sense they are trying to, to have an insight-driven approach to providing better services or utilities to citizens? So that's a really good example. I don't have a lot. So I, I know a little bit about um, the U.S., a little bit about um, Holland, mostly, about Netherlands. Um, in both of those countries, the focus on citizen care, citizen service, is has elevated digital to, to a strategy realm. So in the U.S., we actually just launched what we call our um, Customer Experience Index, which is a measure of SAT, satisfaction, um, and we just launched it for government, for agencies. So we have like 40 or 50 agencies in the U.S. government where we can assess how good their customer service is, basically. And we're uh, doing an event, I think this week, in, in Washington, and it's sold out in like days. So that suggests, anyway, that those agencies are thinking more and more about the quality and the cost of service delivery through digital means than ever before. In Holland, in, in the Netherlands, it's a similar kind of sentiment, but it's a little more focused on the greater good. So they're trying to create a service model that um, also improves kind of the quality of living, not just the quality of service. And so in both those cases, they need data, and they need the ability to act on the data. So this brings us back to the leadership question. But they are absolutely doing it, absolutely. So. Maybe well, one or two more questions, I guess. A few minutes. Yes, please. Hi. So it's interesting that you mentioned Flipkart. When you're talking about uh, emerging technologies and emerging markets, so consumers taking on mm -hmm. new technological behavior, how do you think differently about uh, channel strategy than you would in the U.S., where people are less distrustful of e-commerce, for example? So I don't know that I'm the best person to answer that question, Forrester. We actually have a big team in, in uh, Beijing and another big team in, uh, well, they're all over India, but in India. Um, but what certainly talking to companies like Flipkart tells you is that the distribution um, models in those, in those countries are very fragmented. Tremendous amount of mom and pop uh, distribution, you know, storefronts. And so there's a multi-tiered, often government sponsored and controlled distribution channel like China has that in spades. And now you have these direct to consumer businesses like Flipkart, like, um, crap, what's the big one in China? And so what they're doing is essentially shaking up the distribution model. And so they're go, they're, instead of having a three or four tier distribution model, it's just a one tier model. So manufacturer ships to distributor, Flipkart, Flipkart. Um, and we're not just talking about consumables and, and high tech products, we're talking about cars. <laughs> so it's not a small uh, shift. It's very disruptive. I think there's gonna be probably social unrest type fomented, you know, behaviors that are legitimate in the sense of disruption um, in those markets, but consumers are voting in those markets with their phones. So it is absolutely happening. That's why Zuckerberg wants to put, you know, broadband everywhere. He wants to empower all those people to use his Facebook. Who uses Facebook every day? Who uses it for messaging? Who uses it for news? Who uses it for, well, I guess you use Instagram, photo stuff? Um, who uses it um, for the ads? <laughs> who thinks we're hitting peak ad on Facebook? Yeah, I think um, we're about a year out for their, that having a big impact on their revenues. Because the advertisers are smart about CPMs, about, about conversion. And as soon as they see the conversion crap, they'll go, why am I paying for this? You, you want to charge me a nickel, and I think it's worth two cents. So I think Facebook's little meteoric mobile ad revenue rise is about to, my belief is, that at least in some categories and some markets will hit start to flatten out. Um, anyway, that was a side. One, one more question, quick question. Uh, yes, please. I'm wondering if you saw any high-level commonalities aside from working on the same team amongst the companies that were able to mesh insights into that product team. Okay, so specifically with insights? So. Data. Data and insights. So the, there, there's sort of three things that go into it, um, and, and they're, they're not all of a kind. So the first is um, the data. And so the hardest thing, say, in a bank is to get the data. 
across product lines. So the reason we have these chief data officers is to go get the data. So that's one thing that they have to do, and it's a, it's a psychology thing, because data was power, information was power. And you know why I own credit and you're retail banking, why would I share my credit data with you? So data is the first one. The second is skills, of course, and there's not enough skills, not enough labor, labor because who wants to go work for a bank? So skills. Um, and then the last is infrastructure, is technology infrastructure. And the costs here are not outrageous, because most people are running these things on Amazon using open source software. So the Washington Post runs its entire personalization engine on Amazon, cheap software. It's a small team. But you still have to invest in the technology. So those three things together are, um, are critical. Yeah, good. Sorry, that was the uh, uh, last, uh, last question. So thank you. Thanks very, very much. much.